Welcome to Greater Good Radio Hawaii, where leaders inspire leaders. Greater Good Radio Hawaii is dedicated to social entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Evan Leong, and with me is my co-host, Carrie Leong. Today's guest is Brian Gus, President and Chief Executive Officer of Hawaii's largest human resources company, Ultras. During his free time, he can be found putting his imagination to work in design and technology projects. He is a holder of three U.S. patents, including a baby bottle design and a microchip-based radio frequency time and attendance system. Please welcome to Greater Good Radio, Baron Gus. Welcome to our show, Baron. Thank you for having me. So, Baron, could you tell us how Ultras started and the history behind it? Sure. Really, quite simply, Ultras was started by my father in 1969. He moved our family from New York to Hawaii. Uh, all with the intentions of retiring and sitting on the beach. I think everyone's dream when they move from uh, New York to Hawaii. But unfortunately, money ran out, and he also saw an opportunity. In those days, everything that came to Hawaii was brought in by ship. There weren't UPS, there wasn't FedEx, airline cargo really wasn't what it is today. And so the uh, shipping companies had large containers that needed to be unloaded. As a result, you needed manpower to do it. And uh, these ships used to come in on what I call a frequent but infrequent basis, meaning that the ships came, would come into town, the loads needed to be unloaded, and then work needed to be dispersed. As a result, my dad founded a company called Labor Services and was all about having peak time uh, labor available to unload these trucks and these container ships and such. And since then, that's the start of it. So it just kind of evolved from there into the PEO sure. and all that? Well, it, for many years, we focused on being in the blue-collar labor business. And then little by little, as our, uh, the need expanded in the community, so did the services we provided. So we started with the labor. Then we migrated to uh, clerical help and then technical assistance. And then in 1980, I joined my father. And we were doing something in those days termed payrolling. Large companies like Motorola, Frito-Lay would have people that have worked for them up to the point of 65 years of age. And their internal company policy said those people had to retire in those days. And as a result, they had great people that they wanted to continue to work for them, but they had no means to employ them. So they would do a, what I call a little sneaky thing, and they would reallocate budget dollars that they would have available maybe for temporary help or contingent labor. And they would bring these people back on through our company as temporary employees. So at age 66, they once again would return to Motorola or Frito-Lay or some of these other companies we offered these services for. What age were you when you came to Hawaii? I was nine years old. And then at what age did you realize that you wanted to join your father and be a part of this company as opposed to doing your own thing? Well, I think, as you know, no one necessarily starts out knowing exactly what they wanted to do. I've always been interested, as my bio has shown, in aviation, whether it be model aviation or full-scale aviation. I actually went away to college to a school by the name of Embry-Riddle in Florida, and I, there I studied uh, aviation technology and received pilot's licenses and those kinds of things. And um, my mother was quite ill at that time, and my siblings had all gone off and started their lives. I'm the last of four children. And um, my dad basically needed some help with the family business while my mother took ill. So he asked me to return to Hawaii and help with the business while he tended to my mother's care. And I think, like many people, once you quit school, it's kind of hard to necessarily go back. But I also at that point realized I really had a passion for the family business. I liked what we did. And uh, it grew. I joined my father. It was my father, myself, and a bookkeeper. And today we have over 130 employees. Before that, were you involved? Before um, you went um, to school at aviation school? Uh, yeah. You know, my dad was very good at bringing the business home to the family. <laughs> and, and I think that's the same with all family businesses. Um, my dad had a very unusual life, and I love to talk about my dad more than I do myself. My dad grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, one of eight children in what I would term a real immigrant family. All his siblings were born in Russia and Poland uh, around the turn of the century, and my grandfather came over, and they were ranchers. They were meat packers back in Europe, and so they arrived at Ellis Island like all good immigrant families do. And he basically got off the boat and said, where do they have animals? I want to do what I know how to do, um, you know, ranching and meatpacking. 
And so they said, go out west. So he stopped off in Chicago. And, of course, they already had lots of meat packers and lots of big companies. Eventually, they got off the train in the heart of uh, the Mormon community, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And here they are, a Jewish immigrant from Russia coming to Salt Lake. I think you can imagine what that might have looked like. But uh, so my dad grew up in this meatpacking family. And during the war, he was stationed out in San Francisco in the Presidio. He met my mother, and my mother was out visiting some relatives, and they went on a blind date, if you will. But the interesting story is that my mother talked to my father, this guy basically with cowboy boots and you-know-what on them, to come back to New York and join their family in the interior decoration business. So, <laughs> give you an idea, you know, the kind of uh, salesperson. Interesting. But to prove himself, which, which I really find fascinating, uh, I call my dad a true Renaissance man. The family basically said, you need to go to Europe by yourself and go buy antiquities. And again, this is after the war. Go buy antiquities and then, of course, bring them back to New York so we can sell in our interior decorating store. So here's a guy from Utah, didn't speak any foreign languages, uh, went on the uh, United States, the ship, taught himself uh, German and taught himself French and went over there for six months at a time buying antiques and sending them home. I think that's pretty much, uh, he was paying his dues in order to get into my mother's family. And uh, so he did that for a couple of years. And uh, in New York, he was very intrigued with what was going on around him. And he got into the home building business. Eventually became very successful. IBM had just moved their world headquarters to Armonk, New York. And he got a contract with IBM to build all the, what I'll call, junior executive homes out in the sticks. And in those days, I remember the number specifically. It was $39,900 is what he would sell a home for, and he would build these homes. And uh, he was quite successful in those days at that. But then suddenly, uh, this is in the 60s, uh, Kennedy had been assassinated. And those, most of you were too young to know what it was like in those days. But uh, the economy turned really upside down in the East Coast. Simultaneously, my mother was becoming quite ill at that time. And uh, in the true pioneering spirit that I've explained to you about my father, my mother said, I don't want to live the, the rest of my life in this cold climate. I want to be somewhere warm. So from my sister's graduation present, my father sent my sister and my mother to two places, Australia and Hawaii to see where we were going to move our family for this new warm climate. Well, sight unseen, my mother came out here and said, Bill, this is the place we ought to move to. So it's a little bit like the Beverly Hillbillies. So we loaded up a Volkswagen van and we moved to Waikiki. And that's the story. We drove across country. My dad, sight unseen, and was willing to make what I call the sacrifice for my mother, he sold the building business, and arrived in Hawaii, like I said, with every intention to retire. And here we are today. So... That was the long-winded answer to uh, my dad always brought business home. We were always exposed to what was going on in the family and why the family made the decisions it did and we did. So business and the family situation was always around the dinner table. So when I returned back from school, I already had a pretty good dose of uh, what we were doing. Thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for more on Greater Good Radio.